Howdy, folks. Hello. Are we all OK? Yay. Come on. Are we all OK? This is a cabaret. Yay. Brilliant. Um, what on earth am I doing here? Um, I was happy. I was happy. I was in my workshop. Uh, I had a phone call. Oh, hi, Ben. It's, uh, that's Max. That's the impression. Hi, Ben. It's Naomi here from uh, Do. Uh, we'd love you to, to come this year. So I'm like, yes, brilliant. Yeah, as a speaker. Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, like, so, based on that reaction, um, I thought it best to tell you this... Yeah, sorry about this. I thought it best to just tell you my story, but be as honest as I can about it. Um, so that's what I intend to do. I'm just going to tell you what's happened over the last four and a half years um, and, and just try and talk you through some of the, the things I was feeling as that happened. It's all well and good having these um, amazingly creative and inspirational ideas, but there's a, a, a real side to it all. Um, sometimes it's not very nice. I'm not going to be depressing, um, but just talk about you know, the, the real side of things as well for me. So I've, I've called it Inside the Mind of a, of a Maker, and that is me. Can you see? Awesome. Right, um, so it all started uh, about four and a half years ago. I, I suppose it's important to say I was, I was happy in what I was doing. I was, I was working as a graphic and, and website designer, and, and I, I really enjoyed what I was doing. Um, for my 28th birthday, uh, a colleague and a friend um, bought me a pipe and some slippers. Um, I have a beard and drink real ale. It's hilarious. Um, anyway, me being me, I, I took the, the pipe and slippers home. The slippers were very comfortable. And the pipe, I thought I would learn how to smoke. So I sat at the kitchen table. I'm not condoning pipe smoking, by the way, at all. Um, but I thought I would learn how to smoke this pipe. So I sat at the kitchen table and I, I hit the internet, um, typed in how to smoke a pipe. Once you've filtered through all the weird things that you get, first of all, you get, real, you get a real guy smoking some nice cherry tobacco. So there I was, sat there, learning how to smoke this pipe. After about an hour, um, as you do, you just keep on looking at all the other videos on YouTube, and one thing leads to another. And there was this dude talking about this knife collection with his pipe. So, you know, we, we had this connection of this pipe, and, and I, at that, that, that point, knives for me were um, kind of unimportant. I didn't really care for knives. I remember having a few knives when we went to France as a child that my mum would hide when we got back, and I would never see again. But that, that was it. That was the only association I had with them. So I watched this guy, mainly for the beard and his pipe, talk about this knife collection, um, and just carried on clicking. And eventually got to... Um, this, this young lad, and he was, he was working away in a garage trying to make this knife. Um, through my wisdom, I thought, that looks like a good thing to do. I'll try and make a knife. Um, so, I watched the video, I got some stuff, and I, I, I set about making these, making these knives. Um, like I said before, I was, I was enjoying what I was doing. This just happened to be something else that I fancied trying. I always had projects. Um, the problem with this one, though, is that I fell in love with doing it. There was something about the process, something about the, the, the challenges that I'd faced. I, I, I'm not from a, a wood or metal working background at all. Um, so I, I, I just saw this as a, a nice challenge and something to get my teeth stuck into. One thing led to another. Um, before you kind of knew it, there was quite a lot of knives knocking about the house um, and, and not much to do with them. But the whole process was, it was very organic. Um, not what I was smoking in the pipe, but it, the, it was, it was a, a nice organic process and I wasn't making any decisions at that point. I was just feeling my way through and, and deciding that I just fancied making more knives. Um, so that was, the, the first knife was made just over four years ago. Um, this is my uh, projection chart. <laughs> I've spent a while working on this. Um, that was then, and this is now. Uh, and, and this is how many knives we've made. Um, so, but, it's simple, isn't it? Um, but block, that's the way to do business, by the way, if you just keep going up that way. Um, block Knives was, was formed three years ago. Um, I was in a pub, and I was there to sharpen, I wasn't there drinking. Uh, I was there to sharpen the knives for, for the chef that worked there. Um, and on the way out, 
this random local said, I've heard about you making these crazy knives in, in your cellar. Um, do you mind if I take a look? And at this point, it was just me making these knives in the cellar. So he had a look and had to have one. He said, I've got to buy one. You're not leaving until I've got one of these knives. So that was a, a deal done. I'd sold one of these random knives that was kind of just knocking about in the cellar at home. So I thought, well, actually, I'm from this web and graphic background. I'll, you know, come up with a brand and I'll, I'll pop a website together and I'll see if I can sell any more, just, just to see. It was nice to just have a little bit more money as pocket money and, and, and see how we went from there. Um, so that was, the, that was the start of, of block knives. Um, that's what we make. Um, that's a, that's a four-inch pairing knife. Um, and we make a few others, but we won't go into that now. Um, so I'd like to now talk. That's all well and good. Oh, the guy that you know, watched a video on YouTube and now makes knives for a living. Oh, you know, great for him. Um, but there's certain things that happen and certain ways that I approached it. I, I'm not sure whether I realised at the time, but had, had a big impact on, on making block, you know, the 900 knives we've got on order it is today. Um, and this is my, this is my business model. Um, <laughs> it's called the pots and pans business model. Um, it's, it's genius. Um, when, I, when I was 13, um, I, I was learning to play the piano. I've been learning to play the piano for, for a number of years. And when you're that kind of age, um, it gets to a point where piano is just not going to cut it with the ladies. You, you want to be a drummer. So I, I kind of, I went back home to my parents um, in our terraced small terraced house with neighbours everywhere in a quiet street and told them the good news um, that I wanted to be a drummer. So I've decided I want to be a drummer. It would be great if we could get a drum kit in here kind of pretty soon. Um, <laughs> and, and, and surprisingly, they didn't poo-poo the idea straight away. Um, but what they, what they said was, um, how about you, you buy some drumsticks with your, with your paper round money um, and learn how to play the drums on pots and pans. Um, and mainly cushions, because pots and pans sound horrible. Um, but whether they knew they were doing this... I, mean, I, th I think they were just doing it to say, it'll get bored and then we won't have to buy my drum kit. Um, but what happened is I spent six months... Or, I mean, it felt like years when you're that age, but I spent a long time just playing on these, on these pots and pans. Um, and it, it might sound a bit weird, but if you can play the drums on pots and pans, then when you get a drum kit, it's, it's a hell of a lot easier. To, you know, you've, gone through, you've started off with the raw things that you need. You can drum on anything, but you need two sticks. Um, and I kind of applied the same thing with with block knives. So when I decided I wanted to make a knife, um, I didn't know it was going to be a business, but I thought, well, how do I make the knife in its simplest form? So I'm, I might hate doing it, so I don't want to invest any money. I'll just try it. So I, I got a file, and I got some steel, and I filed the steel into a knife. And that's about a 40-hour job. And if you're not into it after 40 hours of, of making it, you'll never be into it. And if you make another one, you're either a bit crazy days or you're into knife making. Um, and, it, and, and kind of I approached it in that way. I, I started out with the, with the raw things that I needed to make a knife and just let it grow and let my enthusiasm grow uh, and kind of just to just see where we went from there, really. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is a bit of an honest one. Um, when, you, when you make something that you love making, you know, if you've spent 40 hours grinding a piece of steel into a knife, you've, you've got to love what you're doing. Um, when you make something that you, you really love to make, it sucks. It's, it's quite hard, because if you love something, you don't want to leave it alone. Um, you want to be with it all the time. You, you get offended uh, if people, other people don't love it. And I, I struggled with the, with the transition between making something as a hobby and then turning that into a real-life working job. If you say to somebody, I've made a knife in my spare time in my cellar, what do you think? And they go, oh, yeah, it's really cool. What, you've made that on your own? It's amazing. And then if you then go, I've made this knife in my cellar, give me 200 quid. It's a different interaction. And people form opinions. And not everybody's going to like what you do. Um, 
but because you, you love it so much, it, it hurts. It hurts when somebody doesn't like it. So I kind of struggled with that to start with, but then learned quite quickly that actually everybody's entitled to an opinion. Um, there's loads of different ways to make knives. It, it, it just, it was a very, yeah, it was a bit of a tricky time for me. It sounds, uh, yeah, it, but it was. Um, but then on the flip side, obviously, when you, when you make something that you love um, and people appreciate it and things go well, um, then it, th there's no kind of other feeling like it. Um, I think having, without knowing, Blocks kind of inspired a few people. And I just want to tell you about a chap called uh, Leather George. Um, it's not what it sounds like. Um, he... <laughs> Le Leather George was, he was a guy, we were, we were working away in the workshop and this, this, this gent came in and he, he introduced himself, not as Leather George, just introduced himself <laughs> as George. Um, and he said, I've just got a simple, I've just got one simple question for you. Um, can you make money um, or make a living from making something with your hands? Um, and I said, well, yeah, this is, this is proof, we, we, we do this full time. We, we, you know, we, we make a living from it. Um, George had been in leather work for 35 years, and he started out just making handmade leather things. Um, and then as the industry went into more mass-produced stuff, he found himself in a jo job where he was just fixing bits and bobs, shoe repair, and he lost the passion for his leather work. Um, and I suppose this is just an example of no matter at what point, you know, I was 28 when I made my first knife. Um, I was 29 when Block kind of formed. Uh, but it's, it, it's still scary. You have a, a mortgage. I had a wife who was pregnant. Um, and you have, to, you have to be willing to have the sleepless nights uh, and, and put literally everything you've got into it to, to make it work. But, you know, the, the, there are the real things that go in. The bills have got to be paid. Um, so you do what you can. You get another part-time job just to, just to make some money. Um, so this guy, George, was 59, and he thought he was just going to see his working career out as just uh, fixing shoes and fixing bags that were broken. And I said, well, let's, let's do a test. Let's make a case, and if we, you know, if we sell any, then there's your proof that what you do can still be a handmade product. And, you know, there's enough people out there now that actually care about what they're getting and where they're getting it from and who they're getting it from, um, that you could have a business again. So... George went away and took him about five months, bless him, but he came back with this incredible case for the knives. Um, stuck it on Instagram, all the other stuff that you do, and within a week, we had 13 orders for this leather case. Um, and off the back of that now, George has sacked his job. Um, he's in a workshop on the same mill building that, that, that Block Knives is in, and he makes leather goods again. And he can now... You know, he thought he was at a point in his life where, you know, nothing else was going to be, was going to be possible. Um, but yeah, it, it's just really nice to be, be in a position where we, we're dealing with these people uh, and, and now we, we bounce off each other. And it's fantastic just to know that George can now make leather stuff again. Um, so I think I'm just trying to encourage, no matter how young or old, if you really want to do something uh, and you surround yourself with the right people, you take on the right advice, um, and you'll just open and go for it, then it's kind of anything's possible. Um, so, yeah, I just want to finish by showing a quick video of um, it's just George making the case uh, and us making some knives. It's a couple of minutes, and you just get a feel of, of, of what we do. And you can see George's awesome handmade stitching stuff. But, yeah, there you go. Ooh, ooh. 